good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Menace Cranny. And I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. U.S. futures post modest, modest losses uh, ahead of a busy week that includes inflation data and the start of the earnings season. Janet Yellen wraps up a high stakes trip to China. Top Chinese officials gave the Treasury chief a warm reception despite her tough rhetoric. And the oil rally takes a breather as Israel says it's pulling some troops from Gaza. Meanwhile, no progress is made on the peace talks, according to Al Jazeera. She's back by popular demand, and I'm relieved. Man, it's the thing is, you take a week off, you try to relax, and then your dang Bloomberg on your phone keeps popping up with all these headlines. That's what I like. Bit of productivity out of you. <laughs> Never far from a Bloomberg on a phone. Okay, let's get into these markets. I would say that the bond market has been singed, not burned. But that acceleration higher in yield continues this morning. 20 basis points last week, and again, we add another four basis points this morning. Counting down to core CPI, which the core will have hopefully uh, dropped back to plus 0.3 percent, but still year on year, miles away from where the Fed wants to be. Peter, to che Peter Cheer and a number of others have said to me, uh, look, 4.5 is where the real money comes in. Well, I'll, I'll believe that when I see that. Gold takes out another record high. PBOC buying gold for the 17th month in a row. The Indian central banker also saying we are building our reserves of gold. I wonder why. Uh, is it a question about what happens next to the dollar? Net longs on gold are up 13 percent. Brent down 7 tenths of 1 percent. I mean, the pace, the acceleration in this oil market, up 4 percent last week, Danny. We understand Israel pulling troops back from Gaza, but of course we have got yet to understand what is the quantum and the significance, that is the word, of the Iran response to Israel. That is the alpha in the oil market. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you, Manis. And it was those geopolitical headlines, as well as a hawkish Fed, that really gave this equity market the first scare that we've had this year. We see that continue to filter through today. Yes, we rebounded on Friday, but last week was still the worst week for U.S. equities in three months. So we fall lower this morning, marginally, down about a tenth of a percent for both these indices. The good news, according to Mike Wilson, is that that we are seeing a broadening out because of economic news. Can you imagine that? A little bit of a bullish sound from Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley. European equities, they continue to form despite their first fall since January. That was a fun fact from Manus Cranny. Thank you very much for that, Manus. So we're down, we're up about one tenth of one percent. The energy complex really carrying things here. Energy, at least when it comes to the U.S. sector, is at a record high. Meanwhile, Manus, you got some breaking news for us. We have indeed. Uh, this is on TSMC. They are going to get an $11.6 billion worth of of grants and loans. And the idea or the project is to build three chip plants. So, of course, take your mind back, Danny, just a couple of weeks ago, we saw Intel, uh, the major beneficiary of the CHIPS Act. Today it is TSMC. This is the AD or the American Depository Receipt. Uh, the stock up one and an eighth percent. It's going to be made up of $6.6 .6 billion worth of grants and $5 billion worth of loans. So, this is about onshoring and building resilience in the chip space. Yeah, so it's going to support $65 billion in investments, as you say, at the three plants by TSMC. We should keep in mind with this, it's not just TSMC that benefits, but they're also the main chip builder for both Apple and NVIDIA. Yep, $200 billion worth of U.S. investments since Biden took office in chips. And it is, look, that oil market, I mean, it was furiously higher last week, up by 4%. And it was a yeah. lot to do with geopolitics. But I think the interesting thing, though, even with that geopolitical strength, U.S. equities are still 1% away from their all-time high. As Matt Maley over at Miller Tabak yeah. puts it, you should price it in because although supply disruptions are rare, I mean, global pandemics, they're even rarer. So it doesn't stand to defy reason to price something in at this point. I just wonder at what stage does that spike in yields really begin to challenge the equity market narrative because it hasn't really thus far. Although last yeah. week we ended down overall on the week. We spiked higher on Friday on the jobs report, but overall on the week lower. I mean, it's still resilience. And, and let's get more into that geopolitical story because the Israel Hamas war, it has reached its six month mark. Military officials say that Israel is pulling some troops out of Gaza with Netanyahu claiming that victory is coming. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Roz Matheson. So, Roz, we, we have Netanyahu saying this, that victory is coming, pulling troops out. How does it affect a potential offensive in Rafah? 
Well, it's interesting because this move to pull some of the Israeli troops out of Gaza really is probably a four-pronged tactical move by Israel. The first one is they need to rest and rotate some of their troops. They've been fighting in Gaza for the better part of six months. They are leaving significant presence there at the same time. They need to buffer their resources in the north of Israel because they're worried about further attacks from Hezbollah, which is another Iranian-backed group operating in the region, especially in the aftermath of that Israeli strike on the Iranian diplomatic compound in Syria. So they think it might come from Hezbollah. So they need more troops in the north of Israel for that. And they also possibly may be doing this to try and navigate finally a ceasefire with Hamas, part of the agreement of getting hostages exchanged, obviously, also for Israel. But if they pull them out of that major city area, that might just open the door to that conversation with Hamas about a hostage exchange for Israel. So there's that. And also it gives them room to uh, get Palestinian civilians to go more go north out of that chokehold area in Rafah, right near the border, ahead of an offensive. So it's not necessarily about a victory for Israel at this point. I mean, eradicating Hamas is, is a very difficult task. Can you ever actually do it entirely? But it could be a tactical move <coughs> ahead of this potential offensive in Rafah and also to try and get some kind of ceasefire deal with Hamas at the same time. Well, the proposition is that it's an impossibility to eradicate a, an ideology uh, over the physical. Um, we have heard from Iran over the weekend talking about a significant response and warning to the United States. Where do we think this significant response will come from via the proxies in response to the movement by Israel on a, in, in Syria just a few weeks ago? Well, it does feel as though they have to do something. They've been saying for days that they are going to do something and they've really got themselves to the point where they're obliged to react. And, of course, for Iran, what they saw, this attack on the diplomatic compound, is essentially an attack on their own soil. Um, so they are going to be ob obligated to, to retaliate in some fashion. But do they really want to come at Israel directly? I mean, a direct missile strike from Iran on Israel would be fairly well, um, you know, unprecedented. And we're talking about a very big escalation then in a conflict, perhaps drawing in Iran and the US directly. And even Iran doesn't want that. We know from the back channeling that's happening with the US that they don't want that broader conflict either, but they're bound to respond in some fashion. And so what does that look like? More than anything, as you say, it's probably going to be that asymmetric response. So what you get is sort of using Hezbollah, picking up attacks over the border uh, from Lebanon into Israel. That was the most likely response or via some of the other proxies including the Houthis in Yemen indeed well, I think the language that's being used from 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 the uh, from the proxies is ready to slap Israel so let's see what that is uh, Rose thank you very much great context this morning Rose Matheson uh, setting the Middle East agenda and that Middle East political geopolitical uh, upsets is having major impact on the oil markets our guest this morning is Nadia Martin Wigan director of Svelland Capital Nadia thanks for joining us I last week we saw this market moved higher in Brent by 4%. That was a timid geopolitical response, one could say. A rapid in energy, talking about a 30% probability of an escalation in the Persian Gulf, and that could be $40. Escalation risk, how underpriced is it? How, how at the money is it at the moment? Good morning. Good morning. So what we saw at the end of last week was definitely some political risk being priced in, but also it's reflecting fundamentals of a tight oil market that is only going to look tighter in Q3. We had OPEC deciding not to increase production at this point. We expect them to do it in the third quarter. But when we see this geopolitical risk and we see um, additional potential response from Iran, that reminds the market that maybe OPEC can't just bring back 500,000 barrels per day or 2 million barrels per day of production at the drop of, the, of a dime. I don't think the political risk is priced in. We think as Fallon Capital, this is the dip for that buying opportunity because the market is only looking tighter for the next four or five months. Nadia, what does it look like to have that political risk priced in? Is it just $100 a barrel? Is it more than that? Where does it go? Well, it depends on the momentum of who is buying. Um, you know, in the short term, it's very difficult without a U.S. supply response or OPEC stepping in to see an automatic limit. On the other hand, we have refinery maintenance going on in Asia 
in China in particular and in Europe. So that will limit some of that upward buying. So we could start to see some difficulty in the physical market like we saw in October last year. We're nowhere near that uh, in our view right now in, in terms of the physical market building up. So it's very difficult to say at what level. Um, you know, we've broken through $90. We dipped back this morning. That looks like a strong uh, price point. But, you know, May in 95 is uh, probably the next target. But it also depends what happens in the rest of the commodities complex. And this is where we had the Bloomberg Commodities Index rise above the 200 day moving average last week. So that is supportive. You know, that's driven by copper, by gold. Let, you're, you've been talking about in oil to bring in that passive money to support oil to that next leg higher. The, the corollary to this conversation is, of course, where is demand destruction in the new world? We have the PMIs improving. Uh, in China, we have things on the manufacturing side here in the United States are improving. Things are improving on a global basis in manufacturing. And if China is earnest in their 5% target, it could certainly add momentum on the upside. Where do you think in 2024, 2025, demand destruction is, is realistic? <laughs> at, at, at what price? I mean, it's very difficult uh, to, to put a number. You know, historically, we've thought it's more than $100, $110, $120. But of course, it depends where sanctioned oil is. We are now hearing that Iranian oil is going to go a dollar cheaper to China because Brent has moved higher. So it depends if unsanctioned oil, or, or sorry, if sanctioned oil can continue to flow out of Russia. Mm -hmm. That can increase now because these refineries are out. Iranian oil and Venezuelan oil continue to flow. Um, on the other hand, if all of that is squeezed, then on the Brent and WTI prices, we might start to see some tightness. I think a critical point this week is the EIA is going to report how they think U.S. production is going to be coming back after these January outages from winter storms that took down production to 800,000 barrels per day, month on month. So I think that's something to watch in the market to see what that means for communication from OPEC. Because more production from OPEC come Q3, that's right. good for shipping. More out of the U.S., that's great for shipping. And of course, for American producers. Oh, well, it's all, all these sort of incremental things that have started to add up to the supply picture. You have Mexico slashing its crude export. Mm -hmm. They're stranded in Russian cargoes at sea. The Houthi rebels have delayed some of the shipments in the Red Sea. Add those all together, Nadia, what degree of supply disruptions are we actually talking about right now? Well, we have the potential of losing hundreds of thousands of additional barrels of oil, right? And this is where this force majeure in Mexico that was viewed as very temporary, they have a refinery starting up. So that means that more refined products should be coming out because ultimately this is about refined products. It's about gasoline being available. You look at refinery uh, stocks, equities, they are still flying very much so. So um, we, we could lose hundreds of thousands more, but right now, in our forecast, we need a minimum of 500,000 barrels per day, additional supply coming in through Q Q3. And then an additional 500,000 barrels per day minimum coming Q4 over Q3. Mm -hmm. So one thing is the supply shocks. The next thing is about these legs up in production. Nadia, so wonderful to get your thoughts this morning. As you say, oil is lower this morning, $90 a barrel on Brent crew. That's Nadia Martin Wigan of Svelland Capital. Okay, Manus, let's get to some of the other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. Chinese developer Shi Mao is facing a demand to liquidate from China Construction Bank. It's been nearly two years since Shi Mao defaulted. The winding up petition is related to a financial obligation of just over $200 million. And it also marks one of the most prominent examples yet of a Chinese state-backed bank trying to claw back money from a distressed developer. Apple has accepted EU demands to stop barring music streaming services from informing users of deals away from the App Store, but it will still charge a fee on those sales. David Ellison is closing in on Paramount. The new movie producer and tech heir has had a month to seal a definite, a definitive agreement, but first needs to sell Paramount's board on the merger with his production company, Skydance Media. Ellison would serve as the CEO of the combined company, according to the people who asked not to be identified due to the sensitive nature of the negotiations. His father, Larry, the co-founder of Oracle, is one of the several names being floated for the role of chair. Anis. And the CEO of Rolex, Danny, is viewing luxury watches as investments 
is dangerous following the surge in interest from speculators <laughs> during the pandemic. The CEO sees a slowdown hitting the sales of smaller watch brands uh, a little bit more, a little bit harder. Wouldn't he want people to buy it? Wouldn't he like that? This idea that it's an investment, isn't that a good thing to sell to, to potential buyers? Have you tried, well, I mean, if you just got to look at the second-hand market for Have Rolex, I tried to buy a Rolex? I've not tried to buy I, a Rolex. I, I wasn't going to go down that road. <laughs> what you want to do is diversify into Tudor. Apparently, Tudor's uh, having its own moment in this summer. Good sub. to know, good to know. Sober issues coming along. We're talking to we're talking about the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wrapping up her trip in China with a warning against the nation's banks. More on that story. We continue to be concerned about the role that any firms, including those in the PRC, are playing in Russia's military procurement. I stress that companies, including those in the PRC, must not provide material support for Russia's war, and that they will face significant consequences if they do. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wrapping up her trip in China with talk and a sharp warning. For more, let's get over to Bloomberg's Jill Dissis, who joins us now from Hong Kong. Uh, Jill, as we're talking about during the break, I mean, it was a holiday in China, so uh, I guess uh, a few government folks weren't able to enjoy that holiday. So what message was Yellen trying to send on this visit specifically? Yeah, look, I think, uh, Danny, that uh, Janet Yellen came into Beijing her second trip in the last nine months, probably her last as Treasury Secretary ahead of the U.S. presidential election this uh, this November. Uh, she came to deliver a pretty critical message. Um, one, um, we just heard her uh, really kind of warning against uh, circumventing any sanctions on Russia. It's a longstanding um, U.S. Uh, political policy when it comes to China's relationship with Russia, but I think made all the more important by the fact that she's delivering that message in in Beijing. Uh, and then the other bit of her, of her message really was um, to uh, criticize China on uh, issues involving overcapacity. So this idea of, um, you know, exporting low-cost goods to the rest of the world um, to an overextent. Uh, it's kind of interesting, though. I mean, this is a very critical Janet Yellen, but ultimately she still is kind of Washington's good cop and I think has a lot of respect among Chinese officials. And um, it does seem like overall her visit was actually received very well, uh, very diplomatic. And she had quite a few, um, uh, I think, pretty pleasant exchanges with a lot of these top officials in China. How did it go down? If I said to you, what was the reaction in China? I mean, were they robust in their defense about tariffs and sanctions that have been leveled on their economy? as Yellen was in her chastisement of the treatment of American companies. Was there a prid pro quo? Well, Manus, this is um, actually the interesting part of it. So it does sound like, while well, there was, you know, at least a little bit of pushback in some of these private meetings, um, really not a ton. I mean, look, I think at this point, um, the U.S. does have more leverage uh, in meetings like this than China does, uh, the, just because China's dealing with a lot of very, you know, sensitive issues around the domestic economic slowdown. And they do kind of have to play nice a bit with the U.S. ahead of this election in November. Remember, it's Trump, uh, the Republican, uh, you know, presumptive nominee, who's ultimately proposed a 60 percent tariff on Chinese goods, um, you know, see how that far that would actually go. But yes, ultimately, China does have to play nice here a bit. Uh, we saw the strongest response really in Chinese state media, where you got more of that sense of that pushback. But it does sound like, on the whole, her meetings with these top officials um, actually uh, was pretty diplomatic. Yeah, well, of course, uh, there's a new note out from Goldman Sachs talking about that very topic in terms of if, if uh, the new tariff plan came to bear. Uh, it would be what for it would be effective. It would reduce U.S. growth by an eighth of one percent uh, every time China retaliates. So uh, you know it, it's certainly a lot of political hay to make between now and the election. Jill, thank you very much. Jill, this is in Hong Kong. Uh, snapshot of bonds. We talked about this, Danny, which is sort of the vertical movement last week. Uh, it was 20 basis points. Here we are starting the week, another four basis points. This is the European market and the Asian market playing the classic catch up uh, and selling off into that strength on the data that we had on Friday, the jobs report and indeed the drop in unemployment. Yeah, it's remarkable to look around the turnaround and what we're pricing in. Just 60 basis points of cuts now priced in from this Fed. We started the year at 158.
It is Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger back in New York and myself, Manus Cranny, alongside her. What does it take to get back into the heart <laughs> of Kathy Wood? That's the question. What does it take to be number one at Kathy Wood's arc? Innovation fund. I guess a big dip. And Tesla has had a big dip, as you all know from all the conversations of is it really the Magnificent Seven? Is it the Mag Six? Bifurcation, Danny. Bifurcation. Exactly. Well, Tesla falls enough, Kathy Woods will buy. It is now close to the top investment in the ARC Innovation Fund. She has bought the dip. The total weighting of Tesla in it is now 9.6% manas. But of course, you know, I caught up with her at Christmas time when I was filling in on surveillance, and she talked about this moat, and she talked about, you know, what we lacked in understanding about Tesla. I mean, she was selling into that. She was selling for three straight quarters. But maybe this is the thesis, which it is the 12-month forward uh, profit estimate for Tesla has dropped by 30%. Is this a base? Is this where you would want to step in? Do you believe that the price cuts in the, car, in the cars are done. But, but it's this huge rethink we've had on Tesla. Tesla was the, was the growth stock. But when you have earnings like they do, it leads people like Nicholas Kolos from Datatrack saying, if you're going to demand a premium on multiple, you need great earnings visibility or a fantastic story for why it will show up in the future. Tesla has neither of those at the moment, Manus. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the volatility in this stock, Friday it plunged on, on, on this Reuters report about they were scrapping yes. the low-cost cars. Now they're talking about he is, Elon Musk is talking about robo-taxi and unveiling those on all. And he did, he did deny that Reuters report for what it's worth. Yeah, he did. So, you know, you know maybe, maybe that adds it. It is the solar eclipse. <laughs> Danny is excited. She's singing Bonnie glasses. Tyler songs. She is. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna, we need to go shopping for solar eclipse glasses soon, I think. <laughs> Jack Caffrey will tell us where and how. <laughs>
because she said there's no automatic limit unless the U.S. or OPEC steps in. There might be reason for OPEC not to go through with the amount of cuts that they have. But beyond that, 100, more than 100, there's no limit. No, and she, she was sort of very reticent about talking about where demand destruction is at the moment. Yeah. OPEC Plus has the ability to turn the taps on 500,000 barrels pretty, very, pretty, pretty quickly. And the U.S.'s supply being down by 800,000 barrels. And that, too, can uh, ratchet higher as we come out of this maintenance season. So that there are a number of sprigates in supply that can be turned easily. Yeah, well, she says still, by the dip, by this dip in oil. Now, the dip in oil has meant that, again, energy stocks, as I was saying, Manus, have had a really big run-up. And our next guest Rhett, writes on that point that at a sector level, energy is in leadership followed closely by material companies. We're not sure how optimistic we should be on the short term when groups correlated with creating inflation are leading stocks higher. Joining us now is the man himself. It's Jack Caffrey, Equity Portfolio Manager at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Jack, thank you so much for getting up early and for coming in. Okay, why do I need to be worried about what energy stocks are doing? Well, I, I think we've been talking for... I don't know, almost a year, wanting to see a broader market. And we are starting to see that broader market. The challenge, though, is what's underpinned the market so far has been this belief, if you will, the year of the bond coming back, the sense that inflation is going to be slayed, and yet sectors that are sensitive to, if not actual causes of inflation, are in leadership. So either growth is really good, in which case bond yields remain tighter for longer, kind of confirmed by Friday, or we're going to just have to see a repricing of companies that have longer durations to earning cycle versus companies that earn in the here and now. Now, you mentioned you know, energy at all-time highs. It's still only 4% of the market. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, you're not actually getting dramatic moves in materials and energy, but they, under the surface, you're, you're getting some interesting stories under underpinning all that. Do you think this kind of momentum that you see in the energy complex and financials, to be fair, we're counting down to the, to, to the reporting season starting on Friday. Does that momentum build? Do you think that breadth builds? Are you a buyer of breadth and building and growth rather than risk? Ultimately, I think this certainly sets up value for its much vaunted recovery. You know, it had a very nice year in 2022. Um, then it sort of gave a, a considerable amount of that yeah. back. Uh, Certainly a broader tape would actually be a little bit easier. We could stop talking about the Magnificent Seven, and <laughs> Never. which would become the Mag <laughs> Five, perhaps. Um, and we'll have to come up with a new acronym you know, <laughs> as we start working our way through you know, the Mag Five plus obesity um, <laughs> as it works its way through. But Skinny ultimately, five. you, you kind of want to think about it's a market of 500 stocks, not a market of five, and you can ignore the, the other 493. Right. Um, so that, I think, speaks healthier. But when you see such... The, when you see such a concentrated market struggling a bit, I think it yeah. sets up for like maybe sell in May comes a little bit earlier this year huh. and things grind sideways. Sell you know, what a technician would sell call. Sell in April doesn't have the same ring to it. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. April showers. Oh, that's good. April, sh uh, April, April shower showers off. bring us I'm May Irish. It's, it's, there's there's, there's <laughs> there 25 <you> <laughs> variations of rain. Yeah. Well, okay, so Jack, hang on. It's so, a soft rain. I, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get this straight because it's a broadening out which is a good thing, but it's broadening out into sectors that worry us. So, I mean, it, it's, it seems very nuanced here. So in the long term, if it, it's a broadening out, but it's a broadening out, which means a short-term dip, when do I actually get the all clear for things to move higher together in well, this broad sense? I mean, ultimately, that's why you want a diversified portfolio because something is not going to be working at any given moment. I suspect that many people are very overweight, large-cap secular growth, higher inflation, better growth makes large cap secular growth a little less interesting at the margin. Mm. How much do you have to sell of the first or second largest weights in the market when they're at 7% plus and you've got five sectors that are about 5% each? You don't have to see a lot of capital move and effectively start seeing people saying, hey, I'm having a good year, mm. assuming they had leaned into value six or seven months, three months, seven days ago. You know. You mentioned moments ago that the VIX spiked on Thursday. Yeah. It went all the way back to where it's averaged over the past <laughs> year. So, you know, you Big call stuff. it a spike, but it's like, yeah, all right, we've kind of been there. Yeah. Um, you know, a VIX with a 20 handle probably suggests getting a little bit more aggressive rather than at that point, maybe it's never too late to take risk off, mm -hmm. but it's later in that particular rewinding of, of things. Well, Rick Reader was excited about volatility. He, he, on, on Friday when he was with me after the jobs report, was just, yeah, hell, you know, like, let's have a little bit of volatility. I, I'm, I'm a buyer of volatility. 
One thing which I'm curious to get your, your take on is the diversification story within AI, whether you've got to go global for that. If I look at the earnings of the U.S. companies, of NVIDIA, and this is what we've got, this is this morning's story, which is about having to pivot elsewhere uh, to get some returns because the valuations here in the U.S. are so high on NVIDIA, Microsoft, and Meta. I'm not saying you don't have them, but you've got to look at alternative AI options on that. TSMC hitting the tape this morning with a big boost from, from the CHIPS Act to build in the United States of America. So diversification right. within AI, how do you do that? You know, I think ultimately, when we think about technology deployment over in history, everyone goes initially into the obvious choices mm -hmm. and effectively what the names you were citing are more like the arms merchants. Mm. In terms of you don't actually have to figure out how anyone's going to make money off of AI, you can just be certain you're gonna need more chips today. You're going to need more memory sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. You know, a little bit more challenging when a company is spending 50% of sales on capital spending in terms of, you know, their ability to bring capacity online. Ultimately, for AI to work, other people are going to have to find ways that AI actually makes their business clearer, more profitable, and faster. Those stories remain a little bit more skeptical, a little bit more needing of proof points, a few people that we wind up talking to say, fascinating, running a trial, really prepared to be a fast follower once someone mm. actually shows me how it makes me money. And, and I think that is going to be the long and fat tail under which AI actually demonstrates its value. Jack, I can't help but wonder, and I know this is maybe um, a bit of heresy to ask you this since you do manage a public portfolio, a public equity portfolio, but are you at a disadvantage in AI being a public investor? Because it seems like all the excitement is around private companies. Well, I'm a public investor, and I'm a public investor who's anchored off of dividends. So in some senses, I lose twice <laughs> um, in some portions of the AI trade. Um, but ultimately, I think the early moves are generally captured by private companies and small companies, because their ability to talk about AI makes them single points of success. But importantly, those single points of success can also be single points of failure. Mm. If things don't unfold as quickly as you wind up looking to, and having earned this gray hair in three and a half decades <laughs> of thinking about markets, I come back to, you know, we'll use search as an example. Search, we began with AOL, then we went to Yahoo, then we went to Ink to Me, then we went to uh, Ask Jeeves, now known mm. as Ask. We didn't get to Google until about almost 10 years later. So it isn't always clear right. that the first person who comes up with a brilliant idea is necessarily the person who winds up capitalizing and making all the money. Um, you know, there's a snarky response. They're easy, it's easy to find the pioneers. They're the ones with arrows in their back. So, you know, I do think that as we think through this sort of massive transition and potentially an expensive transition, A, you want to be not so convinced that there's only one answer. There's only one company that can solve everything um, and then try to work your way through where does the value chain unfold. Okay, Jack, thank you very much. Uh, a, a very sort of solid, uh, I suppose, reminder of first mover advantage doesn't always deliver all of the profits all of the time. Jack Caffrey uh, at JP Morgan Asset Management, our guest this morning on the market, setting the agenda right here on Bloomberg. It is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Menace Cranny with Danny Berger alongside me in New York. HSBC CEO Noel Quinn says he's pushing to improve his bank's wealth management business capabilities in China and India. So they're just as strong as they are in the home market. Quinn spoke exclusively to Bloomberg earlier today as the bank hosts its first global investment summit in Hong Kong. In 2023, the performance of our wealth and personal banking business here in Hong Kong we saw significant customer acquisition growth. Right. We also saw around about a 50% growth in our insurance and wealth business mm. in terms of the new business they were writing last year. So the facts are wealth management is continuing to develop and grow here in Hong Kong. Mm. The liquidity base here in Hong Kong today is higher than pre-COVID levels. Mm. So I still see Hong Kong as a vibrant financial center. Capital markets are subdued at the moment. 
but that's a function of mm. still coming out of COVID, mm. the economy is waiting to recover, what will inflation and interest rates do? Right. But we're seeing some early signs of the debt capital market starting to pick up as well. Mm. So the facts, I think, support the fact that Hong Kong still is a vibrant financial market. Right. Now, the, I know you're set to report your first quarter earnings in a couple of weeks, so you can't yeah. get into the details as well, but we just wrapped up, of course, the calendar quarter. Yeah. If you could also indulge us, how do you think the quarter went for you guys, generally speaking? Well, 2023 went extremely well, over $30 billion of profit. Record a record, profits. A record profit. Mm -hmm. And that's a culmination of the hard work of our colleagues over the past uh, four and a half years, mm. and also the loyalty of our customers. They've been very supportive of HSBC mm. as we went through COVID and transition. Um, our, return, uh, our returns were the best uh, for over 10 years, and our dividend at 61 cents mm. was the best dividend for 15 years. So I was really pleased with the performance. We're never complacent. We're making sure that we're well positioned for the future, mm. and we're continuing to invest in the business. We're investing in wealth management here in Asia. We've done a number of acquisitions to do that. Right. Uh, the most recent one that we announced was the acquisition of the Citibank wealth management business in mainland China. We bought an insurance business off AXA in Singapore. Right. And we bought an asset management business in India. And again, just to put it into context, every region performed well last year and every business line. In India, we made over $1.5 billion profit. Uh, if you put Bocom and our own shareholding of our own bank in China, we made over $3.5 billion profit. Right. So, well distributed profit across the world and all parts of the bank doing extremely well. We've done some reporting on your plans around your assets in Germany. I was wondering if you could comment on what your plans are for well, those listen, assets. We remain absolutely committed to being an international wholesale bank across all of Europe, including in Germany. So there's no change to that. Okay. Um, so those are not for sale? Those are not for sale. We have some business lines in Germany okay. that are non-essential to international wholesale Understood. banking. And we're considering options for those. And that's what the rumor and the speculation was. Right. But, um, but that is not about our international wholesale banking proposition or right. a corporate banking proposition in Germany. Thank you for clarifying. Assets in Russia, I know the bank has also been looking at that. If you could yep. give us an update on whether those are actually up for sale and when you want those. Well, we, have, have, a price tag for we have regulatory approval to sell that business. We're yep. going through the final stages mm -hmm. of trying to close that transaction. Uh, but it is our intention uh, to sell the business. We have regulatory approval on it. And we're in the, close, we're in the process of trying to close that transaction. The HSBC CEO, Noel Quinn, speaking exclusively with Bloomberg at the Global Investment Summit in Hong Kong. Okay, let's get to the breaking news that we had at the top of the hour. Taiwan's TSMC has won a total of $11.6 billion in grants and loans from the U.S. to build out chip factories in Arizona. There's a part of the CHIPS Act. Let's get over to Bloomberg's Edwin Chan, who joins us now for more. So, Edwin, this isn't the first award we've had from the CHIPS Act. We had Intel uh, not so long ago. So what is the scale of what TSMC's received look like compared to other recipients? Uh, I think it's about uh, the second largest we've seen so far. Intel by far uh, was the biggest award recipient. But I think uh, TSMC being close behind is a, I think, you know, underscores both its scale and the amount of investment uh, needed to keep TSMC at the forefront of advanced uh, chip making. I think we're going to see more to come. Uh, not just American firms, but uh, Asian ones like, like TSMC. I think Samsung and Hynix uh, remain in the running uh, for similar sized awards. Edwin, if, if we put this in context, this is, uh, you know, this is part of the broader Biden administration's ambition about self building, it's about onshoring, friend shoring. Uh, and domestic robustness in the chip industry. Is it delivering and is there, is there much more to go uh, in, in this CHIPS Act? Uh, so that's a good question. I mean, it's a very long-term ambition. It's not just a Biden administration one. You could argue it is a, a broader U.S. strategic objective to onshore not just manufacturing, but also the production of components critical to the economy, to future technology, to, yes, the military and various aspects uh, of national security. I, um, you know, there, there certainly is a geopolitical element to this, and so we're talking about a year's long horizon. I, um, I think we've seen since the 2022 CHIPS Act, 
that the, the administration has uh, moved fairly, fairly swiftly, not just in granting awards, but also going back to the geopolitical aspect, to putting in place policies to contain uh, its rival in China. Uh, so I, I guess initial signs are this is this and other awards are a win for the Biden administration, but we'll have to see you know, over a longer term horizon how this plays mm -hmm. out. Well, certainly uh, based over a number of years in the ambitions of, of new factories in, in Phoenix, uh, it is about scaling up that chip capacity. Edwin, thank you so much. Edwin Chang there uh, on the very latest award to TSMC. Uh, snapshot of what's going on in the commodity market. Brent, which is the global benchmark, has reacted perhaps a, a little bit more virulently to the geopolitics of last week, Danny. This is the this past six days. We're opening this morning a little bit lower, but over the past six days, you can see we're up 4%. Uh, we've just had Nadia Martin. Wiggins, where they're saying any dip in this market is worth buying. We need to understand what the response mechanism is from Iran mm. on Israel. That is the next significant moment for this oil market to grapple right. with because it's got supply outages, as you said. Yeah, because it's, it's not just Israel and Iran, which, of course, no. is the proximate cause for the rise in oil that we saw. But there are things like Mexico, uh, less exports, slashing its crude exports with a force majeure there. There are still stranded Russian cargo assets. The U.S. may be sanctioning Venezuela yet again. And then, of course, the Houthi rebels delaying some of the shipments. You put all that together, and that is supply disruption. And this is where we had the conversation with Bob McNally from Rapid and Energy last week, talking about the minister amount of geopolitical price that's in the oil prices at the yeah. moment. There's a material, non-material possibility, 30% possibility of a major escalation within the Persian Gulf, and therefore that has the capacity to add 40 bucks to this price. There's Brent at the moment, down 1% this morning, as we just see a small drawdown. Yeah, and look, equities aren't reacting either to this geopolitical res risk, as Matt Maley put it. You should be pricing it in because although supply disruptions are rare, they're not as rare as global pandemics. So there's some, some perspective to put into use. Okay, coming up, we're gonna look at some of the market moving events for you to watch throughout the week. It is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger alongside Manis Cranny in New York. All right, let's get you set up for your week for what to watch. And quite literally, we mean that because the U.S. is going to be experiencing a total solar eclipse. It's going to hit New York around 3.18 p.m. Eastern. If you don't have your sunglasses, go get them. I learned today that you can't use normal sunglasses. Anyway, it's another big CPI report. We get that on Wednesday. Traders are going to continue to push back the first rate cut. And big banks' earnings kick off on Friday with J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citi all posting results. And Manis, I mean, I was really close to just going outside and wearing normal sunglasses, so I might have come in tomorrow with burnt retina, so I'm glad I learned that. Go to your public library. You can get them for free. There you go. Fact of the day. Uh, let's talk about Tesla. It's up three and a three and a quarter percent. A little bit of recovery. It's gone back to the top spot in Kathy Wood's flagship fund. Uh, so there's a bit of reprieve for it there. And he did uh, deny over the weekend uh, that uh, the, some stories around uh, delaying production on some of their models was not true. Taiwan Semiconductor's up one and an eighth as they get an 11 billion dollar award of grants and loans from the Chips Act. So that's helping Taiwan. On semiconductors on the AD or there. And Uber down 1.68% as uh, Uber backed e bike startup Line is planning a global fleet expansion. Danny. Manus, a quick check on this bond market as we head to the break because we are at year, uh, highs for the years for yields. We are nearing 4.5%. As Ira Jersey says, if the Fed is truly data de point dependent, can they really cut this year? Well, all the Real money is supposed to be arriving in here to buy these bonds. Bloomberg Surveillance is up next. I'll take you through the next couple of hours of programming here on Bloomberg. Good morning.